and uh, get started. All right, so just want to get started here. Just first of all, of course, want to welcome or just say uh, happy Mother's Day to everyone. And then, um, goodness, uh, mothers are the best for sure. Where would we be without our moms? I'm just thinking even today, Angie had to stay home to be with Anna on Mother's Day because she has to prepare for finals. I mean, just the, the sacrifice, you don't really understand, just as kids growing up, you don't really understand the sacrifice that mothers make until you have kids and you realize, oh my goodness, this, this is like laying down your life. So just really thoroughly appreciate all the mothers and all their sacrifices. We honor you, we appreciate you, and we just bless you today in Jesus' name. Just thank you so much uh, for all you do. Amen. So I hope you have an incredible day, a blessed day. Uh, we honor you and appreciate you. Amen. Okay, so changing subjects. Uh, today, uh, I want to talk about Israel's acceptance. Uh, I just feel from the Lord to, to just really linger here on, on Israel and to really stay focused on this subject. I believe the Lord's highlighting this to us here. Uh, this is the day eight of our 21 days of prayer and fasting we uh, will probably more prayer, not much fasting, but we are joining together in 21 days of prayer for the nation of Israel um, and standing in the gap for the nation of Israel. And uh, um, we're joining together with uh, 5 million intercessors who around the world, that still just blows my mind, 5 million intercessors around the world joining together to cry out to God for his people Israel. Just incredible. And today is actually the 75th anniversary of Israel becoming a nation according to the Western calendar. And so May 14, 1948, the UN voted 33 to 13, or actually that was 1947, but it became official on May 14, 1948, and we're celebrating the 75th anniversary of the nation of Israel. So truly, truly historic times truly, truly prophetic times we live in. And as I was preparing for this message, I felt, and well, time will tell if this is what I'm saying is right, but I felt just this inward witness from the Holy Spirit that this is the most important prophetic message that I've ever shared in my life. So that either means that's right or I haven't shared many important prophetic messages. I Hopefully it's the last, uh, I, this is the most important, but I do, I'm just kidding. But I do believe this is a very prophetic message that uh, is, is about to take place. I'm not sure the timing, um, but of what is about to take place in the nation of Israel. So... Anyway, that's where I'm coming from today. So we're going to get started here. Just want to review just a, a little bit about uh, from last week. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 11, verse 15. And we saw that uh, what Paul said in Romans 11:15, he said, for if their rejection, and that, was, that happened in, in 70 A.D., their rejection began. It's a temporary reje rejection. It's not permanent, but it's a temporary rejection. If their rejection that began in 70 AD, when God took their response, as scholars call this judicial hardening, which Israel had, had rejected for the most part their Messiah that God sent. And God took their, their, their present hardness and their present blindness, and he furthered that blindness and he furthered that hardness in part of Israel to accomplish a greater purpose, and that was to bring in the fullness of the Gentiles. Now, Paul's saying now, if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, that means a, a massive harvest among the Gentiles coming in because of God's rejection temporarily on the nation of Israel... What will their acceptance be but life from the dead? And what I'm going to say to you in this message is I believe with all of my heart we're moving into the day and the hour when God's acceptance of Israel, when he begins to remove their blinders and their hardness from that nation. I believe we're moving into, day, in, into the day when that takes place. I have no idea when it's going to take place. I do believe this time of intercession absolutely has to be a catalyst for that. And I said last week that when, when Israel is accepted by God again, it's going to bring life from the dead. And I said last week 
Uh, there's three things. Number one is it means it's going to be the, it's going to be the fulfillment of Ezekiel's dry bone vision, the valley of dry bones, when God breathed life and he breathed his spirit into this valley of dry bones that came out of the Holocaust, came out of their grave saying, our hope has perished. And God is going to pour out his spirit upon the house of Israel. Life from the dead, I believe, also is talking about a massive harvest that God's going to bring in through Israel's acceptance. The greatest revival, the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit in history is coming, I believe. And then number three, that revival, both in Israel and in the nations, is going to lead to the second coming of Jesus Christ that's going to bring the resurrection of the dead, the literal resurrection of the dead. And so that's the times we live in. That's the hour we live in right now. And I'm going to show it to you just from the prophets, from the prophet Joel, of, of how that exactly is going to take place. But we're living in that hour. And I think you're going to see Joel chapter 2 is going to become so real. So this is a roadmap of the end times. This is the roadmap that says this is where we are headed. And this is where you are. It's now. It is absolutely now. Again, I can't tell you when the f actual fulfillment is going to be, but I'm telling you we're living in that hour right now. And so what we said last week is we must pray for God's prophetic purposes for Israel from God's perspective of Israel, from God's heart for Israel. We've got to stay out of the politics. We've got to stay out of all the political all the polarization of politics. We've got to stay out of human zeal. We've got to not be naive. We can't be confused. We must know Israel is vital, and we must pray based on the prophetic scriptures of what God says for the nation of Israel. Uh, just, just a couple key points from last week. The Lord loves Israel deeply. And if we want to be a people, not just after God's, not just after a God, but after God's heart. See, there's a difference. Terry Bennett said this, is you can, you, can be a, you can be a person who has a heart after God, which is awesome, but David was a person who is a, a man after God's own heart. See, a lot of times you can be a man after God's heart, but it's a lot of times for selfish purposes. When you're a person after God's own heart, that means you lay down your selfish purposes to have what's on his heart. And I'm telling you, what's on God's heart is the apple of his eye, Israel. There's many other things, but Israel is deeply in God's heart. God loves Israel. Israel is still God's chosen servant to bless the world and to shake nations and empires. We cannot forget that. It is a covenant promise that God told Israel, you are my servant whom I have chosen. Even in Israel's hardness and blindness, that promise remains because you're saved today. I'm saved today if you're a Gentile. We are saved because God hardened his chosen servant Israel so the fullness of the Gentiles could come in. And so even though much of Israel today is an enemy of the gospel, Paul said, they are beloved for the sake of their fathers. They are the elect of God, for the calling of God and his gifts are irrevocable. And therefore, we must have God's heart for Israel. God has blinded and hardened part of Israel to bring in the fullness of the Gentiles. And then we also saw that Israel is God's land and the Jews are his people. Okay, so we talked about that last week. We won't reveal, uh, say much more about that. One more thing I'll say is we saw the triumphal entry when the Jewish people said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then I think six days later they crucified him. Jesus said in Matthew 23, you will not, and he was, I'm sure he was referencing what happened in the triumphal entry. He was saying, you will not see me again. He was saying to the Jewish nation, you will not see me again until you say, just like you did a few days ago, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So the Lord cannot return until the bride is made ready, and the Lord cannot return until Israel turns back to God. So those are vital, vital uh, point, uh, events that must take place before the second coming. Uh, now, I want to show you this here. 
is, is go ahead and we'll show the slide here. I think I, sh I showed this to our forerunner school, and it helps people under help people understand this. Um, is, uh, is that up now? Okay. So, are you showing it too on the live stream? Okay. Awesome. Okay, so we're, this, if you first look at this, it's a bit confusing. If I would have had time, I would have just done it in phases, okay? But let's start, let's start from the blue circle, national Israel, okay? National Israel, if you read the prophets, if you read the Old Testament, God repeatedly gave promises to national Israel. Those promises were both related to the land. You know, I will give you the land from Egypt into Assyria, I will protect you from your enemies. And there's a bunch of land promises that are national promises for the nation of Israel. But there's also in the Old Testament spiritual promises like Ezekiel 36, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and I will give you a new heart, a new spirit, and my spirit will dwell within you. And we've talked about that in Indwelling Life. So there's national Israel, the blue circle, that has national promises and spiritual promises. Okay? So now the green circle is Isaiah 49.3 says about Jesus the Messiah, he says, you are Israel. Jesus Christ is Israel. Jesus Christ is Israel. He is what the Jewish nation is meant to be. He is the one whom God made covenant with. Paul told us that in Galatians chapter 3. He said, God made a covenant with Abraham and with his seed. Not with Isaac, with Jesus Christ. All of the promises, both the national promises for Israel and the spiritual promises for Israel, are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. He is the rich root of the olive tree. He is Israel. He is the rich root of the olive tree that both Jewish and Gentile people must be grafted into. And now the, the little convergence of the two circles here is you've got spiritual Israel. So national Israel, okay, so let me just explain it like this. Spiritual Israel is Jesus Christ, the rich root of the olive tree to whom the promises were made. For believing, Jewish, for believing Jews who are grafted back into that rich, rich root of the olive tree, they have national promises and spiritual promises. For unbelieving Israel, they only have natural, national promises. Does that make sense? Yeah. This helps you interpret books like Isaiah and Zechariah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, which can be confusing. However, for believing Jews who are grafted into Messiah Jesus, they have both national and spiritual promises. And for Gentiles like me and you, who are grafted into Jesus Christ unnaturally, like Paul said, we, have, we are now partakers of Israel's promises, that the spiritual promises. Obviously, we're not partakers of the land promises. So that to me, this, this, this diagram right here summarizes, you want, if you want to understand Romans chapter 9 through 11, that diagram for you explains it. And I believe when you read the Old Testament prophets, that is the lens through which you should interpret the scriptures, okay? Should, you know, when you're reading Isaiah, okay, Lord, are you speaking here to national Israel? Are you speaking to spiritual Israel? Lord, are you speaking in, um, before the second coming in the millennial kingdom, Lord? And, and that, because otherwise, if you don't have this, this grid, this, this lens of interpretation, it can be really confusing and people can get really confused. There's, there is so much confusion about this in the church today, so much. And I think this, this is, if I had to say what's Romans 9 through 11 about, this chart here shows that, okay? Next chart here. And what this is meant to show is as the revival in Israel begins to increase, as God begins to pour out his spirit, which I'm going to talk about that over the next few weeks, Spiritual Israel begins to grow. Uh, there should be, yeah. Okay. So as, 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 as the revival begins to increase, spiritual Israel begins to grow. Okay, until, and then the, the next, the last chart, until the green chart, Jesus is Israel, and national Israel 
and, and believing Gentiles are one new man and the, the national and spiritual promises are to this whole green circle, both Jew and Gentile in the millennial kingdom. And so I just want to say this, as God is bringing Gentiles and Jews back into the rich root of the olive tree, Paul said that he is bringing forth one new man. We had a, a, a call yesterday on our Forerunner School, and we were talking about this, how often a lot of times believe, Gentile believers want to, want to become Jewish because they think, okay, well, that's the way of getting God's favor, and that's the way you're going to become closer to the Lord or more sanctified. And, you know, and I was like, you know, we, I, you know I, when I first started learning about Israel many, many years ago, I kind of had that mentality as well. And so, you know, we, you know, we need to become Jewish. We need to, you know, do all these Jewish things. It's like, no. The, the promises... The promises, the messianic, and this is, this is Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. The messianic promises to Jesus Christ, the inheritance, is, are given to the overcomers. Okay, if you're a Gentile and you overcome, you can be great in the kingdom of God. If you're a Jew and you don't overcome, you can be called least in the kingdom of God. It's not based on your bloodline. In Jesus Christ, there is not Jew or Gentile. We are one new man in Jesus Christ. So God does not look at your bloodline to see how he's going to bless you. He looks at the, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Jesus Christ in you. Are you prepared? Have you overcome? And are you able to handle the inheritance he wants to give, whether you're Jew or Gentile? So you don't, Gentiles do not have to try to be Jewish, okay? Let the Jews be Jews. Let the Gentiles be Gentiles. Okay, that said... That's a review from last week. Now, let's turn to Joel chapter 15. Verse, uh, we'll start with Joel chapter 15, verse 30, and 15 through 32. We'll walk through this line by line today. And as I, as I talk about Joel chapter 15 through 32, I believe this... Joel chapter 2, verse 15. What's that? I was said chapter 15. There are not 15 chapters in Joel. Okay, Joel chapter, yeah, you know, unless you have the, the Bible for those who are really spiritual, which, uh, you know, I have, so it's New Revelation, Joel 15, you got to have that. So, no, Joel chapter 2, um, Joel chapter 2, verse 15 through verse 32. Okay, Joel, in the book of Joel, when Joel uses the phrase, he says in verse 15, blow a trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly. Now, if you carefully examine the book of Joel, Joel chapter 1 is about a locust invasion that was coming into the land of Israel during the days of Joel when he was prophesying. Then in Joel chapter 2, verse 1, Joel says, blow a trumpet in Zion. And he, what happens is the scene shifts to the day of the Lord, the last three and a half years of the age. Joel uses this phrase, blow a trumpet in Zion, to shift us from the present context that Joel was speaking into a prophetic end time context. Okay, does that make sense? So Joel, starting in Joel chapter 2, verse 15, when he says, blow a trumpet in Zion, the prophet Joel is shifting us out of the historical context in which Joel was in, when a locust invasion had come into the land of Israel and destroyed their economy and all of that, it was a, it was a terrible thing. And he, Joel called for prayer and fasting based on that. What we see now, starting in Joel chapter 15, that locust invasion that was a real swarm of insects. And Joel says, a mighty nation has come into our land. That was, the, the, the insects were real, but they were symbolic of an army. But in Joel chapter 2 verse 15, the army's real, and they're symbolized by the locust. Does that make sense? So now I'll get into that in a minute. But what we see here in Joel chapter 2, verse 15, the scene makes a shift to the day of the Lord, to the, not the day of the Lord, the days leading to the end times. I believe right now this prophecy is being fulfilled. Right now, in 21 days of prayer and fasting, 5 million people, Praying for the nation of Israel has never been fulfilled in history. We are living in the prophetic fulfillment of that. Incredible. I'm excited. So, incredible. 
Okay. That's the day we live in. That's the roadmap we live in, or the roadmap that guides us to the times we live in. Um, many of you know I am a directionally challenged person. I thank God for Google Maps and Apple Maps because that really helps me tremendously because Angie is like, my wife is absolutely the, I mean, she really could have a job working for like UPS, understanding logistical routes that gets you like two, they're two minutes faster. And I'm just so directionally challenged. But I always like to look at maps and say, okay, this is where you are. This is where you are. And I believe that if you look at Joel 2, verse 15 to 32, it's a roadmap that lays out beautifully that's going to lead to the second coming of Jesus Christ. It begins with a trumpet being blown. It begins with a call to prayer and intercession. And it ends with Jacob's trouble in the day of the Lord. And then that comes the second coming of Jesus Christ. But you know how you see those maps that say, you are here? Joel 2, 15 through 17 is where we are right now. That's where we are. In verse 16, Joel says, gather the people... Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Listen, mothers, gather the children and the nursing infants, okay? Let the bridegroom come out of his room and the bride out of her bridal chamber. You're talking about it's so critical and vital that Joel says, stop the marriage and get to the place of prayer. Bring the kids, even if you're nursing, bring them to prayer. Joel, by the Spirit, exhorts the end time church to embrace inconveniences and disruptions to their schedule. Are you listening? Disruptions to their schedule in order to gather together to pray for the nation of Israel. Because it's not just this prayer time, it's not just about the nation of Israel. It's the catalyst that's going to release the great end-time outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so Joel comes and he confronts. Listen, Joel is confronting right here the end-time church. I'm going to go light on you because it's Mother's Day. Praise God. But (laughs) there's not excuses. Church of why we should not be gathering together for prayer. Look at what he says. He's speaking not, he's speaking, Joel is speaking prophetically to the end time church, saying, there is no excuse. I mean, you would think, okay, we're about to get married, Lord. You would think that's okay, and the Lord's like, no, let them come out of the bridal chamber. You would think it's okay. These are not, by the way, these are not my words. These are Joel's words, the Lord's words. You would think, okay, I've got a nursing infant. I need to not, I need to excuse myself. Or I've got a young child. I need to excuse myself. And the Lord's like, gather the children and the nursing infants. So I just want to encourage us, let's not miss These 21 days, as as we were talking yesterday, so many people that have been gathered, or not so many, some of the people people that were gathered yesterday, we were talking, it's like, and I feel this way, I feel like I am being so blessed right now. I really do. It's a paradox, like, okay, we're going to go pray for 21 days for this nation that's 5 million miles away that seems like it has no relevance to my everyday life, and I'm going to, my schedule, listen, my, sometimes people think, well, the pastor, that's all he does. It's like, I'm a, I'm a part-time, I'm a full-time pastor with a part-time job. I don't have a lot of extra time. My schedule was disrupted to do this. And I want to encourage you, allow your schedule to be disrupted to join us some in our prayer times. Amen. I won't get too hard because it's Mother's Day. But let Let your schedule and let your agenda be disrupted. Please. Please. I'm pleading with you. Let's not miss the prophetic 
hour we're living in right now because our schedules are busy. Please, please, I beg of you, I beg of you, allow yourself to be disrupted. It's not that hard. I promise you it's not that hard. Okay, that's all. Okay. Verse 17. Verse 17. And I'm saying that to the younger people too. I don't know why younger people don't get involved. I don't know. I wish we would. I wish we would. I believe it's the Lord's heart to the younger people to get involved in this prayer time. It is. It is. So if the Lord has given you an excuse to, to not come, uh, that's awesome, but I doubt it. But I just want to encourage you, if you're 40 or younger, to get involved in this prayer time. Okay? It's vital. It's historic. It's related to the end times. Come on, we need to wake up. We need to wake up. We're living in the fulfillment of what for thou, however many hundreds and even thousands of years that they have longed to see the prophets fulfilled. We're living in that day. We're not only living in that day, we're participating in it. We're partnering in it. But we can't be a little disrupted from our agenda and our schedule. Okay. All right. Don't be offended. Now verse 17. If the Lord convicts you, good. If not, don't get offended. Don't get offended because now I'm going to... I debated about how hard I should say that because I didn't want to offend people where they couldn't hear the rest of the message. So I prayed about it and I was like, God, you take over. That's all I'm going to say there. So I just encourage you, take that back to the Lord. Ask him what he's saying to you, not, not, what, not what I'm saying. Just say what... Just ask the Lord, okay, what... Brian was saying today, what are you saying to me through that? Amen. Amen. Okay. Didn't mean to offend you on Mother's Day. Okay. So, by the way, there was, I, I found out when I got here today, there was a bet on which Mother's Day joke I was going to use. And they put, I don't know if they actually put money on it. They said they did. Some people bet money that I would say one thing and other people bet money. I'm not going to say it because I don't want anyone to win the bet. Some people say they would win, win money for the other thing. And, uh, you know, but... I don't even know what it was, but actually I do know what it was, but if I say it, they'll win the bet. Anyway, verse 17. Okay, let the priests, the Lord's ministers, weep between the porch and the altar. Oh, man. That hit on this beautifully today. Our prayer for Israel must move beyond coulda, shoulda, I ought to, I must, intellectual theolo theology to weeping. Now, I'm not saying you have to actually shed tears. I'm not much of a crier. But you can't weep for something you don't really care that much about. And, and I believe Joel's talking to the end time church here. I, I fully, if you read the context, it's very clear. It's, it's, it's talking to the end time church. There's not a lot of Jewish people that are praying this way. It's primarily being fulfilled by Gentiles right now. God's speaking to us. And I understand that I, I totally get, man, I don't, have that, I don't have a heart for Israel. It's like I don't, it's hard. And I, I get that. I, I used to not have a heart for Israel either. And, um, and I just, you know, the Lord just interrupted me one day, and or back, it was back in the year 2000 or so, and I had a dream where I saw two, and I had zero, I thought the people that were into Israel were weird and fanatics and all this, and, and I had this dream in, in 2000 where I saw two Orthodox Jews coming out of Barnes & Noble's bookstore. That's when they, bookstores were popular. They're not popular anymore, but they were coming out of the Barnes & Noble's bookstore, and one of them was carrying a book. They were both carrying books that were about to their shoulders. One of them said Matthew 24 on it. And the other one said Zechariah chapter 8. And I, I woke up from that dream going, what? What? Lord, are you giving, are you trying to say something to me about Israel? I'm like, I, I just, 
I don't have a heart at all for Israel. Those people who do the Israel thing are, are weird. I have no heart for that. I don't understand. I don't understand any of that. And so over just a number of years, the Lord began to, to teach me, primarily from the prophets, primarily from reading the book of Isaiah, and reading it from the perspective of God speaking to Israel. And God just began to give me a heart. And, you know, so even if you don't have a heart for Israel now, ask, here's my challenge to you, is spend some time in prayer asking the Lord to give you a heart for Israel. And then what I've found, too, is it's not just a supernatural thing the Lord does. What I've found, too, is something you've got to take a part in. You've got to study. You've got to read the Old Testament scriptures. God's not going to give you a heart for Israel if you don't read the Old Testament scriptures where he's revealed his heart. I mean, sometimes charismatics just want God to come in and, like, zap them and, like, do it all. And the Lord's like, I can, I can be a catalyst for this. But to really get my heart, go back into the prophets to understand what I've spoken, what I've said. Amen. We need a heart for Israel. Like Dad said so beautifully, we need to, to step into their shoes, to feel what they're feeling, that they're under assault, they're under attack. That we would not just pray intellectually. We would not just pray from a knowledge of Scripture, but we would just get to that place of, of the heart being moved. And I know, you can, I know I'm not talking about trying to fake it. And sometimes people say, oh, I need to weep, and so they begin to fake it. I'm not talking about trying to fake it. I'm, trying, I'm saying a real, genuine, spirit-led moving of the heart. To ask the Lord, Lord, spare your people. They're under direct assault. Iran is about to get a nuclear bomb. Spare your people. That's the nation Jesus is coming back to. Jerusalem is a city that Jesus is coming to to rule and reign for a thousand years. To have God's compassion in our hearts for the hardship and the suffering that they go through. To weep for the Lord's people. To cry out for the Lord's people. Carrying God's heart. Now, I'm convinced God will give that to you if you ask Him. And you'll pursue it. If you will pursue it as if you pursued like a spiritual gift or an answer to your prayer or whatever, I, I promise you God will give it to you. He gave it to me. I'm the last person in the world that would ever have, a, I ever thought I would have a heart for Israel. I'm, I mean, it feels awkward. I mean, it feels really awkward. I'm like, how do you even do this? If God did it with me, God can absolutely do it with you. I promise you, if you'll pursue that, you know, instead of just like trying to say, I'm going to pursue my own things in the Lord, pursue his heart, and this is on his heart. Amen. Reese Howell, this is to remind you what Reese Howell said, and I said last, last Sunday, Reese Howell said, I want God to lay their burden on me. That's beautiful. I want God to touch me deeper still with the feelings of what these people are suffering. God, do it with us. Do that with us. See, the nations have asked for almost 2,000 years, 1,953 years to be exact, where is their God? Because God has rejected them temporarily. God has hidden their face from them temporarily. God has forsaken them temporarily. But it's been almost 2,000 years that God has hidden his face from them. Because of their transgression and because of their rebellion, God has hidden their face. And, they, and, and when they went into the nations where they went, having been rejected by God for a season, the Jewish people went through incredible persecution. Sadly, most of it came through the church. It's, it's so heartbreaking that most of the persecution of the, of the Jewish people in the nations under the forsaking and the rejection of God came from the church. You can look at it, and even beginning in the early church, the anti-Semitism that was coming out from the church, that they are Christ killers and they have rejected their Messiah. 
And that led to the Spanish Inquisitions and the Crusades and all that they went through. Even Martin Luther, the great reformer, who we love, who I love Martin Luther. Hitler used the writings of Martin Luther, the diatribes against the Jews. He used those writings of Martin Luther to motivate and, and to explain to the German people why his final solution was necessary. Much of the reproach and the shame the Jewish people have endured through the, through the almost 2,000 years is because the church has rejected Israel because God has temporarily forsaken her. But I believe that's coming to an end. And I believe God is going to make Jew and Gentile one new man in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. See, they, the nations say, where is your God? Where is your God? Now notice what verse 18 says. When the intercessors cry out, verse 18 says, then, then, then the Lord will be zealous for his land and he will have pity on his people. How incredible. Your prayers, my prayers, this 21 days of prayer for Israel is going to move the hand of God to be zealous for his land and to have pity on his people. I'm not sure when he's going to do that. I have no idea when he's going to do that. I'm confident, I'm absolutely confident he will. And when he does, I believe it's going to be the beginning of Israel's acceptance. When he brings life from the dead. It will be the beginning of a, of a revival in Israel that will, come to, that will cause many Jewish people to turn back to the Lord and put saving faith in, their saving faith in Jesus Christ. It will be the time when Ezekiel 39, 29 is fulfilled. I will not hide my face from the house of Israel any longer, for I will pour out my spirit. I just want to encourage you, your prayers are the catalyst that moves God's heart in his hand to make this a reality. Verse 19, the Lord says, the Lord will answer and say to his people, behold, I'm going to send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied and full with them, and I will never again make you a reproach among the nations. See, I believe there's this mentality about Israel, and, and Dad kind of hit on it a little bit, but there's this mentality about Israel that basically God took them out of the Holocaust, God made them into a nation, and they're just going through these 75 years of war that has been coming against them from an Islamic jihad against them. And then once they get through that, then the Antichrist is going to come and basically cut off two-thirds of the nation and destroy them, and then one-third saved. Now, some of that's true, but I think what Joel is telling us here, no, there's actually going to be a period of in Israel before the Antichrist where God releases prosperity and peace. There's going to be a period in Israel of the greatest revival in Israel's history, greater than the day of Pentecost. That's what I believe Joel is telling us. Joel says, I'm going to send you grain, new wine, and oil, and you're going to be satisfied and full with them, and I'm not going to make you a reproach among the nations. When he says, I will never again make you a reproach among the nations, he's talking about what the Jewish people went through in the dispersion, when they were exiled to the nations, and much of that reproach came from the church. And much of the reason that reproach came is because God had rejected Israel, because God had turned his face from Israel, because God had forsaken Israel. But now when he says, I will never again make you a reproach, he's saying, now, I believe he's saying this, the time of Israel's acceptance is at hand. I will no longer hide my face from Israel. Ezekiel chapter 39 verses 23 and 24 said it like this. When this happens, the nations will know that the house of Israel went into exile for their iniquity because they acted treacherously against me. This is talking about 70 A.D. 
and I hid my face from them. I gave them into the hand of their adversaries, and all of them fell by the sword. According to their, their uncleanness, according to their transgressions, I dealt with them, and I hid my face from them. So when, when Joel says, I will no longer make you a reproach, and the, the, the source of that reproach was God hiding their face, God is saying, I will no longer hide my face from the house of Israel. I don't believe that means automatically all Israel is saved. I believe it's the beginning of a revival that leads to what Paul talked about, all Israel being saved. There is coming a revival in the nation of Israel. And your prayers are a catalyst for that. So I want to encourage you, even though you gather and you're like, okay, I don't have a heart for Israel, I don't know what to say, and you feel like, okay, every single time we pray, we're basically saying the same thing, and it's like, okay, this is a boring. It is a little boring sometimes. Sometimes it is a little boring. But even so, keep being faithful. Keep being persistent. Keep pressing in and saying, God, bring salvation to Israel because your prayers are the catalyst that's going to bring it about. You still with me? Verse 20. But I will remove the northern army far from you. There's coming an attack. This, this prophecy has never been fulfilled in history. There is coming an attack upon the nation of Israel from the land of the north. And God says, I'm going to drive it into a parched and desolate land its vanguard into the eastern sea, and its rear guard into the western sea. Basically, God is going to bring an absolute decimation to this army that comes in from the north. I'm going to talk about that next week. Um, but God, God brings a massive deliverance from this northern army. And he, and he says, it's going to be so massive, its stench is going to rise up. Its foul smell is going to come up for it has done great things. In other words, it's going to, the whole land is going to stink because of the carnage that comes when God delivers Israel from this northern army. This prophecy has not yet been fulfilled. Here's what we know, number one, about this. I just said it. This prophecy has never been fulfilled in history. Number two, I believe, this also tells us, Joel 2.32 tells us that you know, 12 verses down says, talks about the time of Jacob's trouble, which is at the hand of the Antichrist. Therefore, I believe, with, I believe very confidently that this event, this northern army being decimated in Israel, takes place before the Great Tribulation. In fact, I believe it takes place likely, I'm going to explain that over the next two messages, likely prior to the seven-year tribulation. I'm going to go into detail about that, but you can study it. But I believe, it's, it, to me it's really clear, this is not the Antichrist that's taking, this northern army is not the Antichrist. This northern army that's attacking Israel is before the last three and a half years. I believe it's actually before, and I'll explain the why next, next Sunday, or the Sunday after, why it's actually before the, the seven-year tribulation period. But this northern army, if you read Ezekiel 38 and 39, is some kind of an alliance between likely Russia, definitely Turkey, Iran, and several other Islamic nations. It says it right in the text. It's pretty an incredible prophecy. When this army comes into this nation, God is supernaturally going to defeat and destroy this coalition of nations. He's going to lay waste this army from the eastern sea to the western sea, they're going to be destroyed on the mountains of Israel and they're going to look up and it says, uh, the Lord says, even in that prophecy, on the day this army attacks, on that very day, I'm going to rise up and defend Israel and I'm going to release a great earthquake in this nation with hellstone, fire, and with great judgment, civil war, and this nation's going to, this, this army is going to begin to attack one another. That's going to lead to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The picture that, that Joel is painting here, and I want to encourage you just to go back and read it. I want to go, encourage you to go back and study it. 
The picture that Joel's painting is the very same picture Ezekiel 38 and 39 is painting. It's the very same thing. And Ezekiel says that, that they're going to take seven months, seven months, almost a year, seven months to take and cleanse the land from all the carnage of dead bodies that God destroys on the mountains of Israel. And they're going to take seven years to cleanse the land of, and burn the weapons that are destroyed or that are left in that land. It is an absolute supernatural deliverance from God. Your prayers, what we're doing right now, is the catalyst to this. Your prayers are what makes God move and motivates God to move. How incredible. Joel says when this happens, the stench is going to rise up. Its foul smell is going to come up. Ezekiel 39.11, and I'm reading from the King, the King James Version. I believe the based on the Hebrew, this is a good translation, is Ezekiel says, it's gonna, the smell is going to be so bad, it's going to stop the noses of those who pass by. God is going to defeat Israel's enemies on the mountain of Israel. Now, we don't rejoice over the fact that God's going to defeat their enemies. We pray that God somehow might lead them to salvation, even before this attack, somehow, some way. But there are going to be those that will not repent, that God will bring in. He actually says in Ezekiel 38, I'm going to put hooks into, I'm going to hook them in and draw them into the land of Israel. Verse 21. I'm going to talk about that next week. But verse 21, do not fear, O land, rejoice and be glad, for the Lord has done great things. Do not fear, beasts of the fields, for the pastures of the wilderness have turned green, for their tree has borne fruit, the fig tree and the vine has yielded in full. Verse 23, so rejoice, O sons of Zion, and be glad in the Lord your God, for he has given you the early rain for your vindication, and he has poured down for you the rain, the early and the latter rain as before. Basically, uh, verse 24, their threshing floors will be full of grain, the vats will overflow with new wine and oil. See, what's going to happen is after the intercessors stand in the gap for Israel's deliverance, then God is going to release prosperity, great prosperity into Israel for a season, for a season. Verse 25, then I will make up to you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten. So remember I said in Joel chapter 1, the locust symbol, are real, but they symbolize an invading nation. Here, the nation that's invading Israel, but the locust, they're symbolized by locusts. Locusts, they kind of, the way they came and attacked was kind of like a locust invasion. Does that make sense? Joel 2.25, Then I will make up to you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the creeping locust, the stripping locust, the gnawing locust, my great army which I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. Then my people will never be put to shame. So I believe if you really think about this, that Joel 2.25 pictures perfectly Islam's war against Israel that began in 1948. You had the War of Independence in 1948, which, which miraculously, I don't know how, but you had Arab nations coming in from all sides, attacking Israel, and God somehow supernaturally delivered Israel and, and preserved them from elimination. Then you had the 1967 Six-Day War when there was an attack against Israel, and through that attack, Israel recaptured Jerusalem for the first time in, in, since the days of Jesus. Or not even, I guess the Romans actually had control over that then. But it's for the first time in a long, 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 long time. And if you understand end time prophecy, so many of those prophecies are about Jerusalem under Jewish control. It was a historic miracle that happened. 
Then in 1973, you had the Yom Kippur War. And then you had the decades-long battle of the Islamic terrorist organizations that's been going on since about the 80s, attacking Israel in phases and different moves and phases. It really is like this, this phased invasion of a locust army. And the Lord says that through this work, through these 75 years of battle, the Lord has used these wars to do a deep work in the nation of Israel, to prepare the Jewish nation for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Joel said it this way, that through this, the Lord has dealt wondrously with you. The Lord has dealt wondrously with you. So here, here I want to summarize this real quick. There's two deliverances that come for Israel through, this, through this, these prayers. Number one is a deliverance that leads to a salvation, a, a saving faith in Jesus Christ. Again, it's, I, don't, I, don't believe, I don't believe this is saying at, at, at that very moment every single Jewish person is going to be saved. I believe it's be the beginning of a process a revival that breaks forth, that, the, that through that the Lord says, the time of Israel's acceptance is now, and I will not hide my face from Israel any longer. And I will take the reproach away that came upon you because I have rejected you, and now I will, I will not hide my face from you any longer. And God's going to give Israel, the nation, a choice to accept Jesus Christ before his return. And then number two, the Lord is going to deliver Israel from this decades-long Islamic jihad that has attacked Israel since 1948. I'm not saying there won't be other attacks after this, but there's, there seems to be, from this scripture, a period of peace and prosperity and revival that's coming to the nation of Israel. Verse 27, thus you will know that I am in the midst of Israel, and I, that I am the Lord your God, and there is no other, and my people will never be put to shame. Again, I don't believe this. Some people interpret this phrase in the midst of Israel to mean Jesus has returned, but I think it's also used, and you can look at it in different contexts, it's also meant to be that the Spirit, His presence is in the midst of Israel. That's what I believe is, is, is going on here. His Spirit is in the midst of Israel. And you can look, I got it in the notes. You can look at all this in the notes. Now this is where I really want to get to. Verse 28. It will come about after this. After what? After God defeats the northern army. It will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. Pentecost. Set in its appropriate context. See, there's been so many debates. Okay, what's going to be the catalyst? What's going to be the event? How is God's Spirit, you know, everyone's been talking about the second Pentecost is coming. Okay, what's going to kick it off? What's going to make it happen? Is it going to be this Asbury revival? Or is it going to be the Kansas City Chiefs winning the Super Bowl or whatever, all these things? Is that going to be the, the catalyst for Joel chapter 2, verse 28? Now, I believe that God has poured out a measure of the Spirit through those things. But the, the end time revival that's coming comes about after this. See, so many people never put it into its appropriate context to see the relationship between praying for Israel, five million intercessors praying for Israel, and God delivering them from this northern army. It will come about after this. that I will pour out my Spirit on all mankind. The outpouring of the Spirit, the epicenter of it is in Israel, but it spreads throughout all the nations of the earth. And the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit in human history. You are living in prophetic, prophetic hour right now. You are living in the time when the prophets written thousands of years ago are being fulfilled right before our very eyes. It's incredible. The greatest harvest in history is coming. 
The greatest outpouring of the Spirit of God is coming. Pentecost was only the early rain, only the beginning. The latter rain is going to bring in the harvest because the latter rain was used to bring in the harvest. The latter rain that's going to bring in the end time harvest is right here, Joel 2, 28. After this. Wow. Incredible, Lord. I will pour out my spirit in all mankind. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. There's your Mother's Day gift right there. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. See, no one, won, no one won the bet. See, that was, that was out of left field. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Okay, I'm claiming that as I get older. Your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Now, notice what verse 30 says. It flows right out of this moving of the Holy Spirit. It says, I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood fire, and columns of smoke. I believe that's getting us into the end times. See, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit that's going to be unleashed when Israel is delivered from this northern army is going, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit that's coming is going to last until the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's not going to dissipate or go away. We've seen revivals before. We've seen outpourings of the Spirit before. They've lasted for five years, ten years, just a, a period of 30 years sometimes. This outpouring of the Spirit, however long it lasts, is not going to end when Jesus, or until Jesus comes back. And it's probably, it won't even end then. It's going to continue into even greater and greater and greater levels of glory in His millennial kingdom. See, we are living in the days, like Terry Bennett prophesied, of a Pentecost that will out Pentecost, Pentecost. It, this outpouring of the Spirit is coming. It's coming. But the context is vital. Because if we don't understand the catalyst for this great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and we don't do our place in prayer to help activate it and partner with God in it, then it will be delayed. God, God, is, God wants to use our prayers. Verse 31. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Do you see this? This is, this is before the day of the Lord. What verse 31 is telling us is exactly what takes place in Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. When the sixth seal is broken, the sun is darkened, the moon turns into blood. You see, you see that this, this catalyst, this cause and effect thing that's going on here? This end time work of God? Now, verse 32 tells us when the Antichrist comes. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. He's, Joel is talking about Zechariah chapter 14. When all the nations of the earth gather to attack Israel, Jerusalem's captured, half of the city is exiled, and, and uh, Zechariah said in Zechariah 13, two-thirds of the nation perish in the greatest uh, Greatest trial in Israel's history, Jacob's trouble. One third, God saves, and he brings them through the fire, and he purifies them in the wilderness, like it talks about in Hosea chapter 2, verse 14. He, he purifies them in the wilderness, and he prepares them to be part of the bride of Christ, the Jewish element of the bride of Christ, when he brings the Jewish part of the bride and the Gentile part of the bride and makes them one new man and Messiah. Verse 32 tells us it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be those who escape. God is going to mark however many, one third of the Jewish people 
to escape and to be survivors, as the Lord said. So that's why I'm saying, if you read all this in context, this, this northern army coming in is not the Antichrist. It's coming before the Antichrist. It's coming before the day of the Lord. It's coming before the great tribulation. In fact, I believe we're living in the days when this... I believe we're going to... I believe in my lifetime, I'm going to see Joel chapter 2, what I just said. I'm, I believe with my own eyes, I'm going to see that prophecy fulfilled. I really do. I could be wrong, but I, I believe that with all my heart. We're going to see that fulfilled. So let me just summarize here. Is intercessory prayer for Israel leads to the Lord being zealous for his land and pitying his people. This then leads to the northern army being defeated. When the northern, after the northern army is defeated, it says God releases peace and prosperity to Israel, and parallel to that, he releases the end-time outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Israel and in many and in nations all across the earth, which then leads to the day of the Lord and the, and the events preceding the second coming. Incredible days we live in. I want to share, to end this, I want to share a testimony from Angie's aunt, Diane Wicker. She had a, an incredible experience in April. And I'm just going to, I asked her to email it to me, so I'm going to kind of just share it in her words. Is, um, Diane said, my dear friend Sid was my best Jewish friend. In fact, I often referred to her as my Jewish mother. I said I was her Christian daughter. Sid had been a client of mine for years. And about three years ago, she moved into an independent living community where I now work. And our relationship got more special during that time. She turned 101 last year. But she was as sharp as a tack. But her body began to get frail. And I would share Jesus with her throughout the years, trying to you know, lead her to Christ. And she was often interested, in, but you know, even when they went out to pray, or even when they went out to eat, she would ask, Diane, would you pray for us for our meal? And she would. But just a couple of weeks before she passed away, Diane felt like, okay, I need to press in and tell her I want to make sure that she spends eternity in heaven with Jesus Christ. So she asked her, Sid, are you going to be there? Or no, Sid asked her, well, Diane, are you going to be in heaven? And Diane said, yeah, I'm absolutely going to be there. And she said, okay, will you come find me when you get there? She said, of course. But days before she passed away, Diane saw her every single day. And one day during that week, she said she was ready to accept Jesus at 101. Now listen to this. So I prayed with her, and she accepted Jesus as her Savior. And she said, immediately... I feel different. 101 years without Jesus and one moment, one moment with him and she felt different. Now here's what's so interesting. She went straight to heaven. When, uh, oh, then, okay, Diane said she accepted Jesus on the first day of Passover. And she went to heaven on the last day of Passover. <laughs> and Diane said she was my Jewish friend to the end. You know, when I heard that, we were in uh, St. Simon's on spring break when I heard that story. I was like, man, that's, pr that's pretty incredible. But when I was preparing for this message, I felt like the Lord said, that's more than just, it was incredible as it was, it, that she was saved at the very last hour of her life. It's prophetic of what God is about to do in the nation of Israel. The days of Israel's acceptance are at hand. We live in that day when God is no longer going to hide his face from Israel. But he will pour out his spirit upon that land. God, may it be. Amen. Let me pray. Lord, we do pray right now. Lord, we do pray. God, that you would just do a work in our hearts, Lord. Lord. Do a work in our hearts, Father. I ask you, Lord, that we would be faithful as a church to stand in the gap for what you are doing 
in this nation. Let us do our part, Lord. Let us be faithful. Let us be faithful before you. Lord, let us be faithful that we would stand in the gap with your heart for Israel. I pray. And let us be used of God in this assignment in the way you want to use us, Lord. Would you give us your heart for Israel? Let us not even use Israel as a prophetic token of what we want to happen prophetically. But God, we would love your people that live there. And we would love them with your love. And Lord, we would stand in the gap as those who have your heart, your burden, Lord, your, Lord, just the way they feel, what they're going through, they're, Lord, walking in their shoes, God, that you would put that in us, Lord. I pray that we might have your heart for Israel. Lord, I ask you, help us, those who are listening here, those who are listening online, Help us, Lord, I pray. Help us, Lord, to carry your heart, Lord. To carry your heart, Lord. Give us your heart, Lord, for Israel, that we can weep between the porch and the altar with your burden for them, Lord, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. Before we stop the online, I just want to say, I know a number of people have asked us about giving. They want to make a, they want to make, give, a, give to Israel, they want to make a donation to Israel. And so what was on my heart for us to do is to take up a, take up a love offering for our